All right, guys, I want to welcome you to Psychology 105, Critical Thinking Through Problem Analysis for this spring 2020 quarter. Uh, first and foremost, my name is Kevin Rosales, and I will be your instructor for the span of the course. Um, I'd like to just say right off the bat that this is a challenging quarter compared to previous ones, mainly to the current situation that is going on. The teaching environment has changed for both faculty and students. So just bear with me throughout this process. I will do my very best to make sure that you guys get um, the best experience that you can and that hopefully you learn the concepts associated with critical thinking. Um, this will be a bi-directional relationship. So um, I'll put in my best efforts and I expect you guys to put in your best effort as well. Um, so let's go ahead and first go over the syllabus. Yes, I know that I've already posted it on Blackboard, but it is one thing to read it and go through it on your own and another to hear it um, from me. So I just hope that if there were or are any clarification questions or confusion about anything that um, I am able to clear that up now. All right, so first my email. So if you have any questions related to the course or anything at all, just go ahead and reach out to me here. Um, in the subject line, please make sure that you state what course and section you are in. So for anybody in this class in the subject line, you'd simply just type out Psych 105 Section 7 and then just go ahead and send the email over. This is just so I know who it's coming from and how I should deal with it. I am teaching multiple courses this quarter, so that would be very helpful. Um, the textbook is required. Um, so this will be the Halpern and Thought and Knowledge and Introduction to Critical Thinking, fifth edition. Um, I stress that it is a required textbook because a lot of the content on the PowerPoints will be coming from the book. And most importantly, questions on the quizzes and the final exam will come directly from the book as well. So that is why um, just do your best to be able to rent or buy the textbook uh, because you will be using it. All right, moving on. The course is designed to introduce you to the field of critical thinking. Um, we're going to look at critical thinking through a cognitive psychological perspective to understand how critical thinking works, how we can define it, how it relates to our everyday lives, and so on and so forth. So hopefully by the end of the course, you'll be able to understand the cognitive processes underlying critical thinking, be able to recognize fallacious arguments, um, invalid arguments, so on and so forth. We'll learn how to analyze and formulate arguments to either persuade somebody of something or refute any presented claim. We'll understand the empirical evidence that informs critical thinking. This is just to say that we'll be looking at a little bit of research that has shaped how we think about critical thinking today. And lastly, we'll learn to apply the skills that we learn in class to different contexts. All right, so as you know already, based on my previous emails, all of my lectures will be pre-recorded. They will be pre-recorded audio recordings that I will then upload to YouTube, just like I have done with this one. Um, we do have a channel. Um, so in order for us to, to learn the material, you'll just simply um, follow a link that I'll be posting on Blackboard from now on. Um, so every time that I do upload a video, I'll just simply post the link to the video on Blackboard. So all you have to do is simply log on to your Blackboard, go into the YouTube lectures folder, click on the link, and it should take you directly to the lecture. Um, I thought this was a bit easier just so we can avoid the issues of not being able to find the channel, not being able to find the videos, and so on and so forth. Uh, more generally, um, I decided to go with this format for teaching simply because there have been a lot of problems with faculty who have been using Zoom. 
Zoom, although it is very popular, does have very serious uh, security issues. So there have been people hacking into different virtual classroom environments, um, a lot of unstable internet connections, and so on and so forth. So I thought that uh, going this route would avoid those complications. But this is to say that um, this is not also error proof. There might be some errors that come about um, with using this, this teaching format as well. All right, so you are responsible for accessing the lectures the moment that they are posted. Um, try to keep up with the schedule that is listed below in the syllabus and make sure that you're following along and keeping up to date with uh, the lectures that you're supposed to be looking at um, throughout the, the course. So let's get to the meat of the syllabus. Um, there are four course requirements. Um, the first one are the quizzes that we'll be doing. There will be a total of four quizzes, each worth 25 points. Quizzes um, will be in a multiple choice slash true or false format. We will have a quiz after we have covered uh, two chapters. So for example, after chapters one and two, we'll have the first quiz after chapters three and four. We'll have the second quiz after, after chapters five and six. We'll have the third quiz and so on and so forth. Um, quizzes will be taken on Blackboard. So I'll be posting those quizzes on Blackboard. You'll simply log in on the day that you're supposed to log in to take the quiz. <clears throat> uh, very importantly, the quizzes will be timed. And once you have started the quiz on Blackboard, you are not allowed to exit the quiz tab and come back to it. The moment you do exit the quiz tab and come back to it, I'm sorry, the moment you exit the quiz tab, you won't be able to come back to it. Um, the system will just log you out, and whatever score you have received up to that point is the score that will be recorded for your grade on Blackboard. So please make sure that you have enough time to complete the quizzes, that you are in a space that's free of distractions, and that you have a stable internet connection. Um, I do understand the problems arise. If you do have any problems arise with the technological aspect of this, just go ahead and email me. Um, and lastly, you are not able to retake the quizzes. So if for some reason um, you simply forgot or were not aware, um, just keep in mind that you will not be able to, to retake the quizzes unless you have a verifiable form um, of proof to where I can allow you to do that. All right. The second course requirement are the online activities. So there will be 10 participation activities total. Um, it's not enough with just listening to the lectures, with just reading the book. Um, it's also important to add a little bit more exciting activities to the course to keep you guys engaged, to keep you guys motivated, and have you guys learn the material to a different um, level. So these online activities will simply be exercises that I'll be posting on Blackboard um, designed to sort of engage uh, you with the material a bit more, not anything complicated. It might be questions, it might be exercises, um, coming up with examples, uh, maybe telling a little bit about your your experience with um, um, different people, so on and so forth. So um, this is the second component to, to the course. Um, these will also be posted on Blackboard. And from the moment I post them, you will have 48 hours to complete the online activities once I post them. So just make sure that you're always on top of what's being posted and what's being required of you to do. Um, the third course requirement are the discussion board posts. So there will, there will be a total of five discussion posts throughout the quarter. Each of these will be worth 20 points. You will respond to questions that I pose to you guys um, on Blackboard. Um, I will make sure to send out an email once I've posted both the online activities and these discussion board posts, just so you know. Um, for this, you will also have 48 hours to respond to the question. But keep in mind that these are different from the online activities, mainly in terms of the depth of um, the depth of response that is required from you. So it is not enough with just giving a yes or no answer. It is not enough with just saying, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree. Um, to get full points on this requirement, 
you will have to give a much more developed, well thought out answer that incorporates material from the PowerPoints, that incorporates material from the book. If you do both of those things and you show that you have a deeper level of understanding of the material, then you are bound to get full credit on this um, assignment. So just make sure to keep that in mind. And lastly, the final exam. So the final exam will also be on Blackboard on the date provided below. The final exam will be cumulative, so meaning that there will be questions on the final from chapters 1 through 10. Um, but please do not worry about that at this point. I do give thorough uh, final exam reviews, so I will provide a recording of what you need to know for the final exam. Um, so don't stress out about that now. A lot of people tend to do well on the final. Okay, so with those force requirements, the, with those four course requirements, the total points possible in the course is 400 points. Um, and the grade cutoffs are provided here. So just make sure that you're always up to date in terms of how many points you have and where you are um, in the course at any given time point. All right, academic dishonesty. So I'm sure you've heard this throughout many courses before. Just don't plagiarize, don't cheat. Um, just, you guys are old enough to know not to do that. Um, and if you have any sort of disability or need a little bit extra help or any sort of accommodation, um, just be sure to contact this number here and um, let them know what you are in need of. Um, the remainder of the syllabus is simply the class schedule. So, as you know, we did not have a YouTube lecture on Monday, but um, this lecture that we are on now was uh, for today, April 8th. So, in addition to the syllabus, um, we will be moving on to covering some of Chapter 1. Um, not all of it, so Chapter 1, Part 1. And for the next class, we'll go over chapter one, part two, and so on and so forth. So just make sure that you're accessing the lectures that are titled here um, when, on the days that are provided here as well. Okay. What is also in the syllabus are the days for the quizzes. So quiz one will be taking place April 22nd, right after we finish covering chapters one and two. On that same day, on April 22nd, aside from doing the quiz, you're also responsible for accessing the YouTube lecture for Chapter 3, and then so on and so forth. So just make sure that you stay aware of when the quizzes are taking place, just so you know not to miss the quizzes. All right, so that same format is followed throughout the course till we get to the end here, which is June 12th. On that day, the online final exam will be taking place. You will have an hour and 50 minutes on Blackboard to be able to complete that. Uh, so just make sure that you write that down in your calendars or agendas or whatever else you might be using to keep track of important dates and times. All right, so that is it for the syllabus. Hopefully some things were clarified. If there are still any questions, any uh, sort of confusion, uh, please make sure to reach out to me via email. Um, I will do my best to respond within 24 hours, um, but please do not hesitate um, and reach out. All right, so now that we are done with covering the syllabus, let's go ahead and move on to covering some content. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, open up now chapter one. Um, this is, of course, the introductory chapter to critical thinking. Um, make sure that you guys are taking notes. It's not enough of just listening to me talk about the material um, because there will be points throughout the PowerPoints where I'll, where I'll say, hey, this will be on the first quiz. Hey, this will be on the second quiz. This will be on the final exam. And if you're not taking notes, you won't remember what it is that I mentioned um, will be on quizzes or, or exams. So just make sure that you're taking notes, highlighting things, and being engaged with the material. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into this. Um, what we'll see initially are some ideas of what, of what people think critical thinking is. 
um, just a few models of critical thinking and how different researchers um, tend to think about this concept. So starting with this first model here, um, some researchers believe that critical thinking um, is its own component, okay? But it's connected or related to other sources or other factors that together, so factors A, B, and C, make up critical thinking, okay? The second model, other researchers tend to think of critical thinking as a mechanism that relies on mechanisms like A or mechanisms like B. Obviously, these are abstract mechanisms here. Later on, we'll find out what these actually are. But for now, just generally, I want you to know that other people tend to think of critical thinking as a complex mechanical system. So critical thinking depends on other smaller mechanisms to be able to function. All right. Then we have a model just like this one here in which it is very simply put forward that critical thinking is not composed of other mechanisms, is not related to anything else. And more simply, it's just one uniform construct. Either you have lower levels of critical thinking, higher levels of critical thinking, but that is it, not much to it. All right, so let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit and talk about um, what characteristics are important to critical thinking. What, which of the models that we just presented tends to be the more popular, well-accepted model. So let's go ahead and look at a definition that was provided straight from the book, and it reads like this. Critical thinking is the use of those cognitive skills or strategies that increase the probability of a desirable outcome. It is used to describe thinking that is purposeful, reasoned, and goal-directed. The kind of thinking involved in solving problems, formulating inferences, calculating likelihoods, and making decisions. When the thinker is using skills that are thoughtful and effective for the particular context and type of thinking task. So as you've noticed, this is a mouthful um a lot packed in there um so what i've done is that i've simplified this huge definition into a simpler equation down here of what critical thinking is so basically what is being said in that top definition is that critical thinking is the sum of attitude plus knowledge plus thinking skills in the above chunk here there is something that describes an attitudinal piece to critical thinking, a knowledge piece to critical thinking, and some sort of set of thinking skills that are needed to be able to critically think. Okay, so let's go ahead and identify those in this top definition. Okay, so the use of cognitive skills or strategies. So that is the third piece of the formula. This is directly speaking to the thinking skills that we need to have to be able to engage in critical thinking. Okay. Then it talks about thinking that is purposeful, reasoned, and goal-directed. So this is talking about the attitudinal piece of critical thinking. There is a certain attitude that individuals need to possess to be able to engage in critical thinking. And lastly, okay, is the knowledge piece. So when is critical thinking important? What forms of knowledge do we need to have to be able to engage in critical thinking? And that is um, depicted here. All right, so instead of remembering that long definition, I want you to think of critical thinking in the following way. Um, I want you to think of critical thinking as a set of concepts. So not as a two or three or four sentence definition, but rather characteristics or concepts that do make up critical thinking. Okay. The first one, um, you need to know that critical thinking does require the use of cognitive abilities. We cannot be good critical thinkers if we are not constantly engaging our cognitive abilities in the process of thinking critically. 
Second, critical thinking is conscious and it is controlled. So what does this mean? This means that you are aware that you are engaging in the critical thinking process. It is not thinking critically unconsciously. That is not a thing. Okay, Critical thinking requires you to be conscious, well aware of what you're doing, and more importantly, controlling the way that you're thinking about a certain aspect of your own life. Third, it involves being critical about the thinking process. So one thing is to think critically. Another thing is to being critical about how you're thinking. Two different things. So it could be the case that you in your own mind believe that you're being a good critical thinker. But in reality, to the eyes of someone else, that may not be the case. That's why it is important that as a critical thinker, you judge or criticize or give yourself feedback in terms of how you're thinking about things. Four, it's about evaluating the product of our thinking processes. So this means that once you have made a decision, once you have thought about something, is that thought any good or is it not so good? Is it beneficial to you in some way? Is it beneficial to maybe the workplace? Is it beneficial to school? How are your thoughts helping improve society? Okay. If we don't engage in this, then we are not becoming good critical thinkers. And lastly, it's about recognizing and resisting individual biases. So oftentimes, um, there are situations in which we are exposed to something that we are, that we are favorable of, or times where we are exposed to things that we are um, biased against or things that we find unfavorable. We all have preferences for things and we all have dislikes for things. So because we have these preferences, we develop biases for things or against things. Um, when we act purely on these biases, um, we are as far away as we can be from what is called a good critical thinker. So it's important for one to recognize that we do have these biases, that we do have these preferences, and recognize that these biases are sometimes incorrect. Step two to that is that once we know what biases we are more prone to act upon, it's important to resist these individual biases and resist them in favor of being objective, being neutral, and always making decisions that are um, unbiased. So these five concepts here is what you should know for the first quiz. And you should know these specifically in relation to what critical thinking is. What does it involve? So make sure that you highlight um, these chunks here. All right, moving on. So now that we have an idea, general idea of what critical thinking is, it is important to also know what types of thinking are not critical. What types of thinking are not considered critical thinking skills? So the main one is what we call automatic thinking. So this is any type of thinking that does not require effort that does not require any sort of control, and it does not require evaluative judgments, meaning that, for example, tying your shoe, brushing your teeth, saying the alphabet are all examples of automatic thinking. You do all of these just because you do them. They just happen. You don't give much thought to tying your shoe. You don't give much thought to brushing your teeth, and you don't give much thought to saying the alphabet. So the fact that these, these do not require evaluative judgment simply means that once you're, tie, you know, once you're done brushing your teeth or once you're done tying your shoe, you don't think to yourself, wow, I did a great job of tying my shoe or I did a horrible job of tying my shoe, right? That often does not happen. So I know it's a very silly example, but this is just to highlight the fact that um, automatic thinking does not require the pieces that critical thinking does require. 
Um, another example of automatic thinking is sleeping or breathing or, you know, anything that happens without much conscious thought. Okay, so this is just to get you guys to think a little bit outside of the box and come up with other examples that may fall under this category of automatic thinking. All right, moving on. So now, as I said, we're aware of what critical thinking is, or at least concepts that are related to critical thinking. We know what type of thinking is not critical, so that's automatic thinking, right? But why should we care about learning about critical thinking? What does it mean to you? How could it benefit you? And simply, why should you put any effort to learning the material in this class? Okay, I have some reasons here that I believe are relevant, that I believe are valid, and I believe are fair for you guys to sort of become engaged in the material. Okay, the first and very important reason is that we live in the information age, which means that we are exposed to tons of information, and information is sort of clogging up our mind day in and day out okay at this moment at this present moment now we are all hearing information or receiving news about the COVID-19 virus or the COVID-19 pandemic how do you know which information is valid and true and how do you know which information is not valid and false you can only know or even think about that if you are engaging in critical thinking skills. This is incredibly important because maybe most of you might have a Twitter, might have a Facebook, might have an Instagram, might have a Snapchat, and so on and so forth. And I assure you that at least on one or more of those media, social media accounts, you are receiving some form of information related to COVID-19. How do you know that what you're receiving on there is true and factual and something that you should adhere to? And how do you know that you're receiving information that is not true and instead of benefiting you, could be hurting you? You wouldn't unless you think about that being the case. So at this moment, becoming a critical thinker is incredibly important. You can be of use to other people by giving them information that is actually true compared to information that is inaccurate and false. Um, so with this pandemic, um, we have to be good consumers of the information that we are receiving. So this is why, especially now and very relevant to our current situation, thinking critically is, 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 is vital. After that, I have a general list of bullet points here that gives you other reasons for why being a critical thinker is important the first is that it is desired by by employ it is a desired trait by employers and organizations um yearly maybe monthly um research surveys go out to thousands of companies worldwide and within those surveys a common question is as a CEO, as an employer, as a manager, as a supervisor, and so on and so forth, what do you look for in upcoming employees or in prospective employees? What are the traits that you look for when hiring future employees? Without a doubt, and very consistently, at least among the top three qualities that are looked for in future employees, one of them is that they have good critical thinking skills. So for this reason, I stress that you become motivated to want to become a critical thinker. Why? Because there is a life beyond college. There is even a work life now. So I know most of you might have a job or might have had a job before this situation, um, or will have a job after we get over the situation, um, or might be applying to jobs later on in the future. You have to know that what makes you more marketable 
that makes you stand out from the crowd, that makes you stand out from the stack of 100 or 200 applications, is saying that you've taken a critical thinking course, that you've applied critical thinking skills, and that you can use critical thinking skills for the benefit of the company or for the benefit of the organization. So that is why keeping that in mind as you're learning the material in this course should be a motivator for you guys to want to learn the material, not just learn it for the quizzes, not just learn it for the exams, but learn it for your own future, for the for your own good and for the benefit of society at large. Okay. Second is that critical thinking is a proof to faulty marketing efforts. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is that marketing tries to get us to buy into things to buy into products but not just products but also to buy into ideas of things and sometimes the way that they try to persuade us to buy into a product or to buy into an idea is by providing faulty logic that persuades us in the way that they want us to be persuaded that's a problem okay it's not that buying the products are bad it's not that buying into the ideas is incorrect but rather the problem is how we tend to succumb to these products or to these ideas the how part is what we're going to be talking about how do we resist fallacious arguments how do we resist arguments that seem logical but really are not and we're falling to these illogical arguments and making decisions that might not be the best for the time um, or for the current situation. So think of critical thinking as a shield, as a wall between yourself and your decisions and what is out there, okay? By only letting in things that are logical, that are true, um, and that give you the best uh, chances of making the best decisions. And lastly, this is a very general statement, but being a good critical thinker improves our chances of obtaining desirable outcomes. So what I mean by this is that if you become a solid critical thinker, you might make the best decisions in terms of what job you know, to go for in the future, of how to manage your finances, of how to even start a family, what major to pursue. All of these things require good critical thinking skills. And if we lack them, we may, we may fall prey to bad decisions and bad outcomes. So for these reasons here, um, I encourage that you become motivated, that you find some interest in learning the material, and that hopefully what we learn together will help you not just in this class, but also in your own lives at home or at, school, or at work or wherever else um, you are um playing you know some important role in all right so we're going to shift gears again and now we're going to get into the theoretical aspect of critical thinking um we're going to go ahead and discuss and go over a model of critical thinking this model is explained in detail in your book um, but because of its importance, I've decided to also pull it out and talk about it um, here as a class. So let's go ahead and first just highlight the four components of the model. The first one is the ability to learn critical thinking skills. So there are specific skills that we all need to know to be able to call ourselves good critical thinkers. Okay. Second to that, is developing a disposition for effortful thinking. So this is the attitude piece. How do we convince ourselves that critical thinking is useful? And by finding it useful, we'll, be, we'll develop the attitude to want to become a critical thinker. Okay. The third one okay, is this idea of structure training. We'll talk about each one of these in more depth as, as we go, but for now, all you need to know about this one is how do we apply what we know about critical thinking to different contexts? So it's not useful for you to learn the material in this class 
and not be able to apply it to maybe your job or apply it to home or apply it to other classes, right? Information that does not have use for multiple contexts is not useful at all. So that's why it's important for us to be able to use the material in different ways across different contexts. Lastly, is this idea of metacognitive monitoring. Metacognitive means thinking about our own thinking, okay? And monitoring is how are we consistently checking how we are thinking? How are we evaluating the products of our thinking? So these are the four components of the model. Um, I would sketch this in your notes. I would maybe highlight the different components. Um, because this will also be on the first quiz. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and jump into each one of these components and dive a little deeper into e what each one of these um, represents. All right, so starting with the first one, um, there are specific skills that we should have to be considered a critical thinker. The first one involves seeking contradictory evidence. So what does this mean? It means that if there is ever a time where you find yourself to be biased, where you have a certain belief, and you are unwilling to let go of that belief, okay, what you should do is put yourself on the opposite side of the argument. Find the contradictory evidence. Look at both sides of the coin. Look at both sides of the argument not just what you want to believe in because that will make you biased and it will make you um, rigid in terms of hearing other perspectives and being able to use those perspectives to make more informed decisions so see contradictory evidence number two using metacognitive skills to monitor your own performance so this is related to that fourth part of the model but it is a specific skill here, which is just think about how you're thinking. Make that a conscious effort daily to say, hey, I'm in this situation now. I'm thinking about it in this way. Am I thinking about this correctly or, in or incorrectly? The reason why gossip arises between friends, between couples, between families is because most of us do not think about our own thinking. We simply favor what we believe, act based on our perspective, act based upon our biases, and we don't even think about whether that is okay or not okay. Number three, making use of risk benefit analyses. So this is all about the pros and cons of our choices. So for example, some of you might have had the decision to go to Cal State San Bernardino or go to Cal State LA or go to Cal State Dominguez Hills or Cal State Fullerton or whatever it may be. What were the pros and cons or what are the pros and cons of attending CSUSB versus what are the pros and cons of attending Dominguez Hills? Okay. This is what I mean by risk benefit, weighing what is beneficial versus what is not beneficial and doing that for every choice that you have. Um, same thing for buying a car. What are the pros and cons of buying a Ford versus what are the pros and cons of buying a Toyota, right? They both have their pros, but they also both have their cons and which is heavier. By doing that, you're able to optimize how you make decisions and hopefully the outcome of your decision is more beneficial compared to if you wouldn't have done that in the first place. Moving on to number four, having a reasoned method for selecting between several options. So why did you pick CSUSB over another college? Why is it that you favor one brand of car versus the other brand of car? Why are you a Mac user and not a Windows user, right? It's all about knowing the reasons for why you make decisions. It's not enough with saying it's just because I like it 
or it's just because of some subjective reason. But is that reason methodological? Does it make sense, right? Um, having that form of thinking really does improve the way that you make um, decisions out in the real world. Number five, this is a cognitive skill. So recalling relevant information when needed. Really what we're saying is, are we retrieving information from memory correctly or when it is needed? Okay, very simple. Number six, are we relating new knowledge to previous knowledge? So I'm going to go ahead and go off on a slight rant here. Um, because I believe that this skill is incredibly important, but more critically, it's one skill that I don't think is well thought or taught in our education system. So the skill says, relate new knowledge to knowledge that was previously learned. Ever since we hit junior high, ever since we go through high school, ever since we go into college, we think of the world as being separated into different compartments. So we go to fir first period, then we go to second period, then we go to third period. First period was English, second period was math, third period was PE, and so on and so forth. We get to college and it's a very similar uh, format. We go to the social and behavioral sciences buildings. If we are going to take a class related to history, related to economics, related to psychology, related to sociology, related to social work, and so on and so forth. We go to Jack Brown if we're going to take a math-related course, a business-related course, an accounting-related course, and so on. Then we walk ourselves to the chemical sciences building or the physical sciences building or the biological sciences building if we're going to take a course related to biology or chemistry or physics, um, and so on and so forth. The point is that unconsciously we are learning that all of these fields, that all of these majors are independent, that they're separate, and they do not depend on each other. That is a huge problem because the moment that we graduate college and we step out into the real world, guess what? Everything is all jumbled up into one society. Engineers work with psychologists, psychologists work with business people, mathematicians work with chemists, biologists work with nurses, nurses work with athletic trainers, and so on and so forth. The point is that once we leave college, we don't know how our field can help other majors out or other professionals in different disciplines. So relating new knowledge to knowledge that was previously learned also talks about how are we connecting pieces of knowledge together? How are we relating content and other courses to each other? That's incredibly important. All right, so in this course, I'm going to be talking about different examples like that, where I try to make you understand that what we're learning in this class can also help you in your math class, can also help you in your sociology class, can also help you in your English class, and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. All right, enough with that. Let's go ahead and move on to skill number seven, um, understanding basic research principles. So there's going to be a chapter in the course where we are going to discuss the scientific method. How do we obtain knowledge? How do we create knowledge? At a time like the one that we are living in now, um, where nothing is known, related to how we can cure COVID-19, to how we can treat COVID-19, researchers around the world have an incredibly, an, an incredibly important job at this point, which is to try to come up with the cure or with treatments quickly. If research did not exist, for one, we would not have cures for the hundreds of other viruses that we've been able to, to treat. And we would not have an idea of how we can now go and attack this virus as well. So that is why um, research principles are an important piece of knowledge for you guys to grasp by the end of this course. Number eight, thinking probabilistically. So this will be chapter seven. This is where we talk about how do we take probabilities 
into account and how do probabilistic thoughts influence our own decision making so for example a very simple example is what are the chances that it will rain tomorrow what are the chances that it will not rain tomorrow what are the chances that you know i might wake up and see this on the news what are the chances that i'm driving on the carpool lane by myself and that i will get pulled over by a cop and what are the chances of that not happening right so on and so forth if we don't think in terms of probabilities we are more likely to think that things might not happen to us or we might freak out more than we should when the reality of something happen, happening to us might be very low, so on and so forth. So that, that's what that chapter will be about. Um, skill number nine, demonstrating an advanced ability to read and write. So reading and writing, very basic skills. We've done them ever since we were young. For this class in specific, the reading part is important. Critically think about what you're reading. Critically think about you know what I'm saying, what I'm discussing with you guys. Um, doing that both in this class and in your other courses is important. You have your own mind, you have your own way of thinking. You may think about things in a critically different way from the person, um, um, from the next person. So it's important just to make sure that you know that you have your own ability to, to think about things and to criticize things. And, you know, being good critical thinkers pushes science forward in an important way. And the last skill is how do we formulate and present coherent arguments? So one chapter, chapter five, will be all about how do we compose an argument that persuades people okay, and persuades people fairly. So how do we present a coherent argument that makes sense? Not an illogical argument that may seem logical, but at the end of the day does not make sense right? We're going to focus on one, what is needed? What is needed to construct a good argument? And two, how do we present it? Okay, so those are the, the, the skills that are necessary to become a critical thinker. And just to highlight, this is not an exhaustive list. There are plenty of other skills out there, but these are the skills that I believe are most relevant to you guys and to the work that you'll be doing later on after college. All right. So we will go ahead and stop here. Um, this is moving on to the second components of the model. So we'll go ahead and pick it up in the next class here. Um, for now, please make sure that you, know, you review your notes, you're constantly going over the lectures, you're highlighting things, that you become engaged with the material. If at any point you have questions, please go ahead and reach out to me with any questions regarding the content, regarding the course, and I will be happy to answer within 24 hours. Okay. If not, that is it. Um, I will be in contact with you guys with anything related to the course. And for now, please stay safe and be well. Thanks, guys.